Welcome to this presentation, working with different Power BI data model frameworks. My name is Peter Myers. I'm a principal at my company, Bitwise Solutions. I've worked with Microsoft Business Intelligence for over 20 years, evolving from SQL Server BI right through to the self-service BI delivered with Power BI today. I'm a most valued professional with Microsoft of over 14 years, and my focus today is on consulting, mentoring, and training. All right, well, let's talk about some basics in Power BI Desktop. We're probably all aware that it's a data modeling and a reporting tool, and it's easy to get this application. If you've got a Windows PC, it's freely downloadable, and you can install it in either 32 or 64-bit versions. It is, in fact, the companion application designed for use with the Power BI service, and it integrates proven technologies that you might be familiar with that were previously Excel add-ins. It's updated at least once a month, and the main reason for updates are new features and the occasional bug fix. And be aware that there is a different version if you're working with the on-premises Power BI, known as Power BI Report Server. Now, our focus here today on the basics is to really emphasize just how versatile Power BI Desktop is, because it supports four different development modes, Live Connection, Import, Direct Query, and Mixed. Now, Live Connection is the odd one out. This isn't a data modeling task. In fact, what you're doing in Power BI Desktop is connecting to an existing model in the Power BI service. So effectively, Live Connection is a reporting mode. When there's a need to create a data model, you can work with the other three modes. And therefore, in Power BI Desktop, you can develop a model and a report. So let's talk first of all about Live Connection. What this means is that a live queries are sent to a single model. That model could be hosted on-premises in SQL Server Analysis Services, it could be Azure Analysis Services, or perhaps more commonly, it's a Power BI dataset that already exists in a workspace within your tenant. Let's see it in demonstration. Okay, so here I am in Power BI Desktop, and I need to create a report off an existing dataset in Power BI. This is easy because on the Home Ribbon tab, I just click on Power BI Datasets. I can then go ahead and choose, and here I see a nice promoted data set for sales analysis, and I go ahead and I create my live connection report. So notice there in the bottom right corner, we can see the status is telling us this is a live connection to an existing data set. And I can take a look then at the fields, and then I can use these to build out a report. For example, I will need to filter by year. So let's place a slicer, and I'm going to go ahead and filter by the first year, calendar year 2017. I then need to see monthly sales, and uh, I also need to see average unit price. So this is easy. Let's just bring in month, and I'd like to see sales, and I'll throw unit price into the line value. And it looks like I'll need to sort these uh, by month and ascending order. Awesome. And then I know for this report, I also need to see by state. So let me do that on a map. And I'll just bring in the state, and then I'll just plot sales as bubbles on that map. Now we also have sales uh, states categorized by region, so I'll add another slicer whereupon I can multi-select you know, different regions. Beautiful. And I'll remove the title from this report visual, and then I will copy paste it. Because not only do I want to see it on a map, but I also need to see the numbers as values in a grid. So I'll just take that, switch that visual to become a table, and then I can add in my quantity. And I can sort in descending order to see that um, you know, for those uh, regions that it's Illinois that's producing the most. In fact, across all regions, we'll see it's California, that in calendar year 2017 was producing the highest sales volume. Now, I produce this report and I share it with my manager and she's like, hold on a minute. The purpose of this report was to understand at uh, state level how effective our marketing campaigns have been and therefore what I need is a sales per capita measure. So while it's possible for me in this mode, in fact, I can create new measures. Be careful here, they're not measures that are added to the model or the data set, they're measures that are defined in the report. But the problem that I have is that when I look in the state table, there's no population field. So for me to produce the report that meets the requirements of my manager, 
I'm going to have to create an entirely new model. All right, so a live connection here to an existing model doesn't help me. Not at this stage anyway. And so the main benefits of live connection mode is it allows you to exploit existing data assets, helping you to deliver a single version of the truth. You can add new measures using DAX to your reports, and it separates model development from report development. But bear in mind there is a limitation. You can't extend the model with new data. Now let's consider import modeling. This is the most common mode for modeling in Power BI Desktop, and you use this mode to develop a data model importing data from one or potentially more supported data sources. Literally, data is cached, and it can be imported from files or databases or online services or ODBC or OLADB sources. In fact, it doesn't matter where it comes from because once it's imported, it can then uh, be integrated with other data to present a single model perspective. So here we see an example of Power BI Desktop importing from different formats and sources to deliver a single model. All right then, let me go ahead and demonstrate creating an import data model. Uh, the objective of this model will be to analyze sales and uh, also the effectiveness of statewide marketing campaigns. So here I am in Power BI Desktop. I'm going to go ahead and save my solution yet to be developed, but I have a demo folder here. So I'm just going to call this my sales analysis for import model. All right, now let's just take a look at that in my demo folder. And we can see initially it has a size of 11 kilobytes. All right, so let's start by bringing in some data. So I've got this very convenient tile in the middle of the report designer to import data from SQL Server. Now the all important point at this part of my development is the data connectivity mode. And you'll see the default here is set to import. In a later demonstration, we'll explore how I could develop a direct query model against the same source. Let me authenticate using current credentials so I connect. And I'm going to keep this model super simple and then presented with a list of uh, databases on that server. And I'll expand the Talspin Toys 2019 US, and I'm just gonna go ahead and check two of the tables, for sales and for state. Now, I could be tempted to just click the load button, but that would be a mistake. It would load all columns and all rows. It's important in an import model design that I'm as efficient as possible, and uh, that means importing the least amount of data that will reduce the model size, that'll allow the model to grow to a larger size in the future, and will conserve resources and speed up queries. So I'm going to click Transform Data instead. Uh, this will open up the Power Query Editor, whereupon I can define more tailored queries for what my model needs. So I'll start by selecting the state query. Um, and actually, let's start with the first query, which is sales. So the first thing that I do to reduce the uh, size of the model is I click on choose columns, and I'm going to remove columns that just aren't relevant to the model. In fact, all I need is the customer state ID. Uh, I'll bring in uh, the order date as well and um, quantity and unit price. So now I've reduced all of the columns just down to four. In acknowledgement that I need to analyze sales, I'm going to multi-select quantity and unit price. And on the add column ribbon tab, I can just introduce a new column that will multiply those two. And then I'm going to go ahead and rename the column from multiplication to become simply sales. And while I'm at it, I will double click the unit price column header and rename it just to unit space price, much more friendly. Now to the second query for the state table itself, uh, I'm going to do the same thing. So on the home ribbon tab, let's choose columns. In this case, I need the identifier, the code, the name, and I'll bring in region as well. And what, what we'll note here is that the region column is in fact um, prompting us to perform a join to a related table. And so I'm going to expand region to introduce the region name, and I won't prefix the column name with the table name and so that I end up with the region name column. And let me go ahead then and rename the columns to make them friendly. And there we have a single query comprising columns from two source tables. Now, what's interesting here is that in the applied steps, I can right click and open up the native query. 
And it's here that we can uh, get some insight as to what will be sent as a statement to the source database to retrieve the data when importing into the model. Note the use here of um, a join and uh, also the aliasing of columns into those friendly names. All right, I'm ready to load those queries to the model. So it's at this point in time that those power queries are um, used to import data into the model. All right, so some 357,000 sales rows just loaded. Um, I want you to notice a couple of things. So in the fields pane, uh, I've got a couple of tables so I can expand them to show all of the fields. Uh, I want you to notice on the left hand side that I've got three different modes that I can move between. I've got the uh, report view, data view and model view. And I also want you to notice at the bottom right corner there is nothing there. Okay, indicating that this is an import model. And you'll see in later demonstrations that we'll have a different status depending on the architecture or framework that we're using. So at this stage, what I'm going to do is switch to the model view. Uh, we'll see that we have two tables here. And um, what I'm gonna do is select the first table and just point out to you that in the properties for this table, and let me expand the advanced, that there's a storage mode here and it's set to import as we would expect and the same for the state table. It's also an import table. Okay, what does that mean? Let's take a look at the storage size for this model. And um, so I'm going to have to save this Power BI desktop file. And we'll come back and take a look at the size of the PBIX file, which has grown to 363 kilobytes, representing that um, you know, 357,000 rows of sales data plus the state information. All right, well, the next stage for modeling is to go ahead and create a relationship. So it's actually the customer state ID that I can drag to the state ID to create a relationship between those two tables. It didn't automatically detect that because the column names are different. All right, I'll just do some quick modeling. So it's also a good idea to hide columns. So let me multi-select those columns used for the relationship. I'm going to hide them. Um, I'm going to format some columns, so quantity will use a thousand separator. And for sales and unit price, um, I'm going to, what should I do here? Uh, let's make these to two decimal places. And I'll also turn on the thousand separator. Uh, for unit price, um, because it's a rate, I want to ensure that uh, when summarized, so down here in my advanced properties, um, it won't sum them together. It will in fact use average by default when it must summarize multiple prices. Um, I've got some spatial columns, so state and state code. I can multi-select these. And then in the advanced, I'm going to specify that they are in fact categorized as state or province. And then I recognize that I have a hierarchy as well. So I'm going to right click region, create a hierarchy, we'll name it states and uh, introduce the second level which is the state itself all right so now you'll see in the table that i've got a regions hierarchy also all right so some fairly simplistic updates so now let me switch across to report view and let's review in the fields pane what the model interface looks like all right well one concern i've got is that the order date is actually an automatic hierarchy. And I've got a lot of bad things to say about automatic hierarchies because it's not what I want. It's not customized in the way that data analysis would be done for this company. So that prompts me to come to the options and settings here in Power BI Desktop. And specifically, I'm going to turn off a feature known as auto date time. All right. Notice what happens when I click OK, pay attention to the fields pane, and you're going to see that that auto date hierarchy disappears. All right, because there's a better way that I can solve this problem. If I want a custom date hierarchy, then I really should create a date table. And so that prompts me then to come to the modeling ribbon and create a new table by using DAX. All right, so the table will be named date and it's going to be based on the calendar auto function. And this function is a special function that returns a table of dates as we can now see when I switch to the data view. All right, I can then enhance it with an additional column here that I would name year. 
and year is simply going to equal the literal text of CY concatenated to whatever the year value of my date column is. And I'm going to add one more, which is to analyze by month. So let me come into column tools, create a new column. This time month is equal to, and I'm going to use the format function this time, and I'll format the date column using yyy hyphen mm. And that'll give me the month number with a leading zero for the first 10 months. Okay, I've messed that up, missing one y. And now we see I have year and month. Now, when I go ahead and save this file, we should note that that has in fact increased the size of the model. Um, 362 kilobytes. Now I've forgotten, has that actually decreased the size? It shouldn't have, but it should have increased it marginally by this table, you know, comprising 1,095 rows representing date. All right, I can switch to model view now and we'll see that I've got an additional table. Uh, and therefore what I can do is create a relationship between sales and date. I can go ahead and multi-select those columns. I'd like to hide them. And I'll go ahead and create a calendar hierarchy here in my date table. And I'll add in month as a second level. Now, date tables are special in your model, so what I will do is switch back to the report view. And on the modeling ribbon for the date table, I'll go ahead and mark it as a date table. And this provides clues and um, configures that table suitable for time-based analysis and specifically uh, time intelligence calculations you might have using DAX. All right, I now have an import model ready for reporting. So let me build out a simple report here on page one. I'm going to bring in a slicer based on the year field. And let me go ahead then and filter by calendar year 2017. Uh, then what I'll do is I'll introduce a combo column line chart. And here what I'll do is I'll plot the months along the axes. Uh, we'll take a look at sales as the column heights. And then that unit price, and remember I've requested a default summarization of average, should be shown um, against the months. Now, I will need to update that it'll sort by month. And specifically, it will sort by month ascending. And now what we get to see is for the filtered year of 2017, there are the 12 months and there is also the average price. All right, uh, let's uh, build it out to be a little more interesting. I'll add in a map beneath. Let's take a look at, um, yeah, let's take a look at the um, states that we have. And I just simply want to plot sales. And then I might want to filter these down by region. So let me just add in another slicer by region. And we'll see that all of the, um, the sales regions are actually grouped into these regions. For example, New England. Okay, looking at a map is one thing. I'm just going to turn that title off. It doesn't look good on a map. But what I will do is copy paste it to produce a second visualization of that data. Uh, and specifically, I'll switch the visual to become a table. Um, it's here that we can get to see state and sales, and I might choose to add in quantity as well. And if I descend or sort the table in descending order of sales, we can see quite clearly here that California is uh, leading with uh, you know, a big chunk of sales, 1.3 million for 2017. Now, remember, the objective of this model isn't to analyze sales, but the effectiveness of statewide marketing campaigns. And to do that, um, what we're going to do is bring in some population data to then perform sales per capita. Now, what I've done ahead of time is I've found this awesome web page that gives me US state population based on census data. So I'm going to copy that URL and then I'm going to come back to the import model and I'm going to bring in additional data from a new source. And this is the versatility of an import model is that we can bring in and import data from any type of source. And, um, and it's very simple to do so. So back to the Power Query editor, I'll perform a few transformations to get the data just right. And essentially what I need are two columns, the state and the population. So let's take a look. Table two looks good. We'll go ahead and transform the data in this table.
All right, so I can see that row one has the United States. That's the total. So I'm just going to perform a filter and uncheck United States. I uh, don't need the rank column. I can remove it. I can rename number to become population. And then lastly, I could rename this query to just become population. Now the smart thing to do here is to switch to the state query. And then on the home ribbon tab, um, I have the ability to perform a merge. All right, so here in the combined group, I'm going to merge queries that state will merge with population where there's a match on the state name. All right, I need to set some privacy levels that the um, database is organizational, but it's a public web page. And this is important when it comes to um, query folding and sharing of information between data sources. I can see that I've got a good match that all 51 states, that includes DC, uh, have found a match. So when I click OK, I've performed that merge and this is where the integration in fact is happening. I now have a population column. Let me rename that to become population added to the state table. Importantly, and to reduce the size of my data model, here in the queries pane, I'm going to right click the population query and disable the load. It means it will not load as a table to my model. Let me go ahead and close and apply, whereupon, and watch the state table here in the fields pane. When the import completes, we'll see the addition of a new field being population. And there it is. So in fact, what I'm going to do is hide it. I don't want users to know it exists, but what I can now do is come to the sales table and add a measure. All right, and that measure simply says sales per capita equals. And I will use the divide function. Divide the sum of the sales sales column by the sum of the state population column. I'll go ahead and format that measure as a percentage. And now I can meet the objectives of the report by dragging that measure into my table, getting a sales per capita. And now when I sort it in descending order, I can see that it's Alaska, even though it has a small volume of sales, but per population, it's actually doing the best out of all of the US states. While I'm at it, I'm gonna select the, the map visual and I'm also gonna add that measure into the tooltips. So now as I hover over, for example, California, I can see its sales per capita is 3.55. And up here for Alaska, it's 5.58. All right, let me go ahead and save that solution. So I now have this sales analysis import Power BI desktop file comprising an import data model that integrates two sources, and it also has a report. And in total, we see that that file comes to 370 kilobytes. Now I've just developed an import model comprising data from two sources, being SQL Server and a public web page. I've extended the model with a calculated table to support effective time-based analysis, and I've enhanced the model with measures, hierarchies, and other model properties to improve the usability of the model. Now, once published to Power BI, I'd set up data refresh to schedule on a recurring basis to ensure that data is current. Perhaps once a day, it'll import the data from those sources. Note that because SQL Server's involved, a data gateway would be required to allow the Power BI service to connect and refresh from that source. Lastly, I would grant permission so report authors could build their own reports based on that data model. There are numerous benefits for import modeling. It enables data integration, supports all Power BI data source types, the entire Power Query functionality is available to you, as is the entire DAX functionality, including calculated tables. It also supports the natural language Q&A and quick insights that deliver AI uh, perspectives across your data. However, watch for limitations. Because it's an import model, there will be restrictions on the size to which that model can grow. In a share capacity, that is one gigabyte. Yet in premium, you can grow to much larger sizes. Because the data is only as current as the last successful refresh, you're likely to schedule periodic data refresh. So you'll need to set that up. That might also involve setting up data gateways so the Power BI service can connect to on-premises sources. Be aware also that data refresh reloads the entire table. There's no partitioning. 
That can be problematic for large models with large tables because you must reload all of history again, but there is a feature known as incremental refresh that may be possible for your source and the structure of your data. Let's now talk about direct query modeling. In this mode, we develop a data model that directly queries a single supported data source. And it's restricted to typically relational databases, and I include the list here. Let's focus on the common ones like SQL Server or Azure SQL. So what happens is that when Power BI reports query a direct query model, it translates the DAX queries from the visuals into the query language of the underlying source. So what's being fetched is up-to-date live data. All right, so in this next demo, I'm going to replicate where possible this import model as a direct query model. So let me go to the file ribbon here in the backstage view. I will create a new report. Okay, so I'll dismiss the getting started window and then I'm just going to import data from SQL Server again. Now, before I do, let me do a save as and I'm going to save this file as the sales analysis DQ. All right, so as I did in the previous demo, I'm going to click the tile. It says import data from SQL Server, but you'll see when I do this, I can switch to direct query mode. What that means is all of the queries I define will have a table storage mode of direct query. So as I did in the previous demo, let me connect to the sales and state tables and transform the data. All right, so what do we see here? Okay, let's start with the sales query. Uh, same thing, I'm going to reduce the number of columns down to the order date, the customer state ID, and I need quantity and unit price. I can perform a calculation uh, in a new column by multiplying quantity and unit price to come up with sales, and let me rename the unit price column. So, so far, it's much the same development. Now, what I've got is... Yeah, now let me do this. Let me finish with state and repeat what I did earlier. So before we get into the more interesting side of this design, so let me just bring in what I need and bring in that region name. All right, a couple of renames here. And then what I'll do is I will create the tables in the model. Okay, so close and apply. Now with direct query storage mode, let's see what this looks like. Paying attention to what we're about to see on the left side and the bottom right. Okay, so the left side, notice that there is no data view. And there's no imported data, so we can't see it in Power BI Desktop. And in the bottom right, in the status, we see that the storage mode is in fact direct query. If we take a look at the tables and fields, they're much the same as what we saw earlier. So switching to model view, what I'm now going to do is to create that relationship again. Now, here's where we see a first difference. I have this additional property to assume referential integrity. Now, that's important. The SQL statement that might be required when joining tables, will it use an inner or outer join? And if you're confident that there's data integrity between those tables, perhaps being enforced by a foreign key, then we can uh, tell Power BI that it should use an inner join that is more efficient. All right, so that creates the relationship. I can go ahead and just hide columns. So I'll just do a, a number of formatting options here. Um, and um, that's probably as far as I'll take it. Now, what this means then is that if we're going to replicate that report design, my first issue is that I have an order date column, but I don't have year. And in a pure direct query model, I can't create a calculated table. So it's going to force a redesign, and the compromise I'll make is to return to the Power Query editor, whereupon I'm just going to add two columns to the sales table. All right, so I come to add column. I'm going to create a custom column, whereupon I say that a new column named year, I want the literal text CY, and then I've got the date, give me the year of the order date column. 
But because that returns a number, I'm going to have to convert it to text. So that's the M expression that is going to give me, as we'll see here, my year as a label. Now, when it comes to bringing in the, uh, what did I want, the year and month, let's add a second column, and I'll call this month, and I'd be looking at doing something like this. And, and there is a function to take the text, or rather a date, convert it to text, so my order date here, and to use something like this. Give me the year and month format, like a format function. Now, note that when I do this, I'm actually getting a warning here saying that while you can do this in Power Query, it's not supported in direct query mode because it won't translate directly to a statement that can be sent to SQL Server. So it forces me to redesign this, and I'm going to use a snippet to just make this quicker. This is the Power Query expression that is going to work to produce what I'm looking for. So you'll note that it's a lot more complex. All right, so now it delivers what I want. I'm going to go ahead and set the data type so that they're both text. And uh, let's take a look at the native query. You see all of those expressions get translated to T-SQL, and while that's fantastic, we've got to take great care. This is very inefficient, especially on a large fact table to have this type of calculation taking place just for the purpose of grouping or filtering. But look, it will produce the right result, but it's not efficient. So now that I've got those additional columns added to my table, uh, I can go ahead and close and apply, and we'll now see that the sales table will have year and it will have month columns. The difference here is that we do not have a date table, but we can produce the result that I need. For example, go ahead and give me all of the distinct years in a slicer, and there we go. Uh, go ahead and produce that combo column line chart. Again, we'll go ahead and put the month on the shared axes. Let's go and bring in sales on the columns and unit price on the line. Uh, I'm going to have to set this to use the average function. Uh, we'll go ahead and we'll update the sort order. So go ahead and show me ordered by month ascending. All right. And uh, just for completeness, let me quickly throw in that I do need that region and state. All right. So we've got state here on the legend, or on location rather. And uh, we'll put sales on size. Now be aware that as each visual is uh, showing us data, it's actually querying. Uh, the SQL Server database for us via the direct query model. All right, and then we've got copy paste, and then we bring in the table. Da, da, da. And there we go. We've got a very similar model here. This time showing state sales, and I think I'll bring in quantity as well. All right, now here comes the problem. In order to achieve the objective of our report, which is, remember, sales per capita to assess the effectiveness of statewide marketing campaigns, we have a problem because part of the data that we need is residing in a web page. And a pure direct query model isn't going to support the integration of other data. So we'd have to stop at this point and say we can't do it without you know, um, going back to the source database and actually pre-integrating the data there. So in fact, the recommendations would be for a direct query model, where all tables are direct query storage, is that we would materialize a date table and simply connect directly to it. Think about it, if you work with a data warehouse, it will have a date dimension table, so that problem would be solved in that particular situation. When it comes to the population data, we would pre-integrate it into the state table by adding a new column and then the direct query model could get to it directly. All right, so while I could continue to design this report page um, and I could uh, you know, solve the problem by pre-integrating in the data source, I won't go that far in this demo. Now, I don't recommend this data model design. It's highly inefficient because of the date fields and their calculation logic. The calculations are evaluated each time the date fields are filtered or grouped. And if the data source sales table were to contain large, large volumes of data, it would be slow for Power BI and probably for other applications accessing the source data. If I insist on creating this pure direct query model, 
I can improve performance by optimizing the data source, adding a date table, which by the way is an accepted practice in a data warehouse, and I could also pre-integrate that state population value into the state table. We can still benefit from using a direct query model, but we would need to design a composite model, which we're going to be exploring next. All right, lastly, let me go ahead and save this file. And if we take a look in my demo folder, we'll see a direct contrast here that the direct query model is just 20 kilobytes. It's really just metadata describing the model and the report definition itself. There is no data imported inside this Power BI desktop file. All right, let's look at the main benefits for direct query modeling. There are no limits on the size because it's not an import model. So it enables reporting over large volumes of data and there's no need to configure data refresh. You can also deliver near real-time results. So if you have highly volatile data, a direct query model could be suitable. But there are also many limitations and restrictions. In a pure direct query model, there's no support for integration of data sources unless you pre-integrate in the data source itself. Model Power Query queries written in M can't be overly complex because they can't all be translated to the native language of your data source. And for this reason also, there's limited support for DAX functions. There's no support for calculated tables because these result in imported data. No Q&A, although it's in preview at this stage, or quick insights. And you need to be careful because a direct query model can be slow, especially if the underlying data source is not optimized for the queries that Power BI will be sending. And be aware also it could negatively impact on data source performance for other applications and reports that are directly querying that source. All right, well, now that we're familiar with import and direct query modeling, let's consider the middle ground, the blend of the two being composite modeling. In Power BI Desktop, we refer to this as mixed mode, allowing us to develop a composite model combining import and direct query tables. The table has a property defining whether it's an import of data or a direct query. It's not a model level property, it's table level. Now, if you have a direct query model, you can now enhance it with calculated tables, with data integrated from imported or in fact other direct query sources. You can set the storage mode for a table to be both import and direct query. This is known as dual storage. And this design approach can help speed up single table queries specifically dimension tables that are typically used in slices. Finally, aggregations can be added to your model to accelerate and boost the performance of higher grain queries. So what this means then in Power BI Desktop, we develop a model and report. Let's consider that you have a direct query model. Now we refer to this internally as a data island. All of the tables come from the single direct query source. But now what we can do is introduce another data island of imported data, and let's consider that we could use calculated tables. Okay, so let me now work with the direct query model that I produced in the previous demonstration, and uh, I'll start by doing a file save as, because this is going to become a composite model. And the first scenario will be, of course, the calculated table an improvement beyond having this sales table that has a year and month field in it. So what I'm going to do first of all is edit that query for sales. And let me undo the work that I did by introducing those calculator columns. So I'll right click this step to add the first column and then I will delete until the end. And that effectively removes the year and, and the month columns. So I'll close and apply. Now, of course, this will have the effect of breaking some visuals that were dependent on year and month, but we'll repair those shortly. Now, what I can do on the modeling ribbon is I can introduce a new table. Now, I want you to watch what happens in the bottom right corner the moment that I do this. You'll see it's switched to the mixed storage mode because a calculated table will import data. So very similar to the demo I did creating the import model, I'm going to use calendar auto. And then I'm going to go ahead in the data view, which is now available to me in mixed mode. And I'm going to go ahead and add that year column and month column. So year equals CY and the year of the date column. And then the month. 
is the format of that date column as yyyy hyphen mm. Okay. Uh, now when I come to model view, you'll see that I've got a date table here and then I can create that relationship from order date to date. All right, now interesting, this is what we call a cross island relationship. Um, note the assume referential integrity doesn't apply here now because the date table is actually imported data. Okay, and then I could just go ahead and uh, if I had more time, I would polish this off. All right, so let me go ahead and fix the visuals. It means that my slicer now will be based on the year field and that I will fix and restore the month on my shared axes. Uh, that looks like it will require me to also resort the visual. There we go, down here. Sort by month ascending. Okay, so now this composite design gives us the benefit of an import table and um, with direct query data. This design solves one problem, but actually introduces another. The calculated table rows need to be passed to the visual to achieve the correct result. And again, the recommendation is to materialize a date table in the source database. It would be far better than achieving a design with a composite as we see here. Let me go ahead and save and let's take a look at the file size to see that um, the composite model now is 50 kilobytes, an additional 30 kilobytes storing the calculated table. And next, let's consider that we could import data from any other supported Power BI source. So picking up from where I left on the previous demo, uh, what I can do is demonstrate how to integrate data from another source. Now, remember the objective was to produce that sales per capita. Um, so let me show you a neat little trick. If I switch back to my import model and let me open up the query designer, um, it's possible to copy a query like population. All right, and then I'll close that and then I'll switch to my composite model and then I'll open up the query designer here and you can paste it straight in. So now I have population and uh, when I close and apply, this is creating a table of import storage mode, importing the data from the web page. All right, so let me point this out to you here in the model view. Oh, hey, listen, I forgot something, was that that was disabled. You see, here's the issue. I will not be able to merge the state, which is a direct query store, with the population, which becomes an import. Okay, so what that means is I'm going to have to do the integration at model level, not at the power query level. Okay, so what I'm expecting to see here is that I will have that additional table for state and population. And here it is. So let's take a look in the advanced properties for this table is that this is an import storage table versus the state table that we'll see is direct query. Uh, but what I can do is achieve integration by creating a relationship between them. In this case, it is a one-to-one -one relationship. It detects unique values in both state columns. And then what I'll do is I will hide this table so it's not visible to report users. But to achieve the result of that state level um, sales per capita, I can go ahead and create that measure. In this case, sales per capita equals divide, still the sum of the sales column, and this time it'll be the sum of the population population column. And so we can see this calculation is spanning both direct query data and data imported into the model. All right, so now I can add my sales per capita into the table, and I can sort in descending order again to see Alaska there achieving the best result. Okay, there's an example of composite modeling and the ability to import data and integrate it this time using model relationships. And now let's consider that we could convert tables to use dual storage mode. So they're both import and direct query. Power BI will decide what is best given the query that it needs to satisfy. 
Okay, well let's see how I can now further enhance this composite model by configuring a table as dual storage. So let's remind ourselves here in model view that uh, we've got a sales table and a state table, they're both direct query, and the date being a calculated table is imported and population is imported data as well. Now, the state table, we could benefit from having this as both direct query and import. And let me just revise the design here of the page. What if I add another slicer? Uh, and uh, this time it's for region. See, let's understand that that's issuing a direct query statement to get the distinct regions from the state table. But because it's a single table query, and it's a reasonably static set of data, I don't expect you know, new states or regions to be added or modified. Uh, what I'm going to do is switch back to model view select the state table and in its advanced properties I'm going to configure it to be dual storage. So what now that means is that it's going to be import the data and therefore when it's queried as a single table it will query from the import data. Alright, so that means now we will see that this result is actually from the imported data. But what happens for example when I filter by Midwest is that the state table will behave as direct query because effectively in a single SQL statement we can join the state and sales together and apply a filter on the state table and therefore the state table would use direct query mode for that filtering operation. But like I say, to populate the region slicer here it could use the imported data. So there's a great example. In fact, you'll find that when you have a direct query model, you can accelerate query performance uh, for these single table queries. Um, so it's specifically your dimension type tables that are used for filtering and grouping can be set to dual storage mode. And lastly, let's consider aggregations designed to boost and accelerate query performance, especially over large direct query tables. Okay then, well let's see a fourth way that we can introduce import data into our composite model. This time, with the topic of aggregations, I'm going to boost or accelerate the performance of sales queries in specific circumstances, that if it's sales or a quantity value at a date or state level. Alright, so I'm going to open up the query editor and I'm going to duplicate the sales query. That's easily done. I just copy that query and I paste it. Or well, actually, I can just duplicate it and then I'll rename it as sales ag. And then I'm going to apply some transformations. So applying a group by, this is typical for an aggregation, is I'm going to group by order date and by the customer state ID. And I'm going to produce two columns. The first will be quantity that is really the sum of the quantity column and the second aggregation will be sales, which is the sum of the sales column. So we'll now see that that step results in four columns to group by order date, group by customer state ID, and then produce the sum of quantity and sales on those date state values. Now I'll go ahead and I'll apply that change to the model. The question is, is that going to create a direct query table or an import table? Well, the way to answer that is we'll switch to model view so we can see the table here and in the advanced properties we can see that it is in fact a direct query mode table. Now that's not our intention. So what I'll do is I'll switch it right now to become an import table whereupon it's now going to import the data into the model thereby increasing the size of the model. So let me save the model at this stage and we can see that our composite model has grown to 506 kilobytes. That's sort of interesting when I look at the original model size of 370. I cannot explain why it's so large. Shouldn't be. Uh, okay, and now that it's import, I know that I need to change the data type of the quantity column. Mm, that transformation of um, grouping and summarizing produced a decimal, but I know it needs to be whole number. This is important because in the sales direct query table, it's a whole number as well. The types must match when I manage the aggregations. Now, before I manage aggregations, let's just create some relationships. So from the state table, I can relate state ID onto the customer state ID. And from the date table, it's the date to order date. Now, at this stage, this is just another import table. 
Okay, but by managing aggregations on this table, we're telling Power BI that in specific circumstances, if there's a grouping on the sales table for the customer state ID, or and a grouping by order date, and there's a request for the sum of the sales table quantity or the, uh, the sales, then, then this table can act as an alternative query source. All right, so under these circumstances. Now, when I apply this, notice now that the table itself and the four columns are all hidden. In fact, it's not even possible in DAX formulas to reference this aggregation table. So now switching back to report view, you will see nothing different in the fields pane. But what is different? For example, if I'm to filter on New England as a region, I can assure you that the map and the table are now using the import aggregations. I can tell you that the combo column line chart isn't because unit price is part of its query and that wasn't aggregated. All right, so aggregations are great for boosting the performance of direct query tables. And in this example, it was an import aggregation. So let me finally save this Power BI desktop file and then we can see that our composite model has grown to a size, in this case, 502 kilobytes. A main benefit of composite modeling then is mixing of modes. In a single model, you can leverage the benefits of each mode on a table-by-table -table basis. You can enhance a direct query model with calculated tables, you can integrate and combine multiple direct query sources, and you can accelerate performance over direct query tables with dual storage or aggregations. Be aware of some limitations. When you have relationships between tables coming from different data islands, they're known as limited relationships, meaning there's possible performance or integration issues. Import tables will require periodic refresh to remain in sync with the direct query data source. Poor or overuse of features can result in poor performance. And you cannot connect to Power BI datasets using direct query, but wait. We have a really amazing announcement. So coming soon is that composite models will allow you to connect to Power BI datasets and Azure Analysis Services. This opens up a whole new potential. And if you think about my first demo with the live connection, that I was looking for population values to produce the report my manager needed, this wasn't possible. It forced me, in fact, to redesign the entire model in Power BI Desktop to integrate some population data to achieve what my manager needed. Well, with the new approach coming in December in the public preview, is that you'll be able to achieve this direct query over the data set and integrate it with additional data. So you can read more about that here in the platform release details for Wave 2 of 2020, or better, at this conference, please look up the session Jerowen is presenting on updates to Power BI composite models, and he'll talk about this new capability in much more detail then. All right, let's wrap up with some resources then. So I've included some links here. The presentation should be available to download in PDF. Um, I just want to point out um, a number of them. In fact, I wrote all of these articles as an author uh, from Microsoft with their guidance documentation. Uh, when it comes to import modeling, uh, especially when you're modeling large volumes of data. Please understand Star Schema and the importance for Power BI and how you can use Star Schema design methodologies to produce an optimal and intuitive model. Also, data reduction techniques for ensuring that you import the minimum data to achieve what your model needs to deliver. For model guidance for direct query and composite, we've got separate articles. And to know more about relationships, I made mention of limited relationships that take place between data islands in a composite model. So there is the concept that a relationship is either regular or limited. So to learn more about how these uh, relationships are evaluated, please read the uh, model relationships article in Power BI Desktop. Well, that concludes the topic here of the different Power BI model architectures in Power BI Desktop. Special thanks to Microsoft for supporting this conference and community initiatives, and uh, a way to thank you. There are prizes to win, so please check out how you can uh, be in the winning for these prizes. Thanks very much for watching. I hope you found this video to be informative and to be of helpful to you in your modeling endeavors.